you're interested in becoming a successful property investor, my chat today with leading demographer Simon Kirstenmacher will be of real benefit for you because we're going to talk about a particular trend, a demographic trend that is critical in understanding how our property markets are going to work moving forward. Well, what is that? It's probably not the trend you're thinking about, but it's home ownership. And considering homeowners make up 70% of our property markets, I think you're going to get benefit from my chat. So welcome to today's show. Welcome to the Michael Yardney Podcast, where twice each week you will learn a number of new ideas regarding success, property investment, and money in around 30 minutes. Our show is brought to you by Metropole, who specialize in helping you grow, protect, and pass on your wealth through strategic property and wealth advice. Now, here's your host, Michael Yardney, Australia's authority in wealth creation through property, who has been voted one of Australia's top 50 most influential thought leaders. We often talk about Australia's passion for home ownership and how we're different from other parts of the world. But are we really? Now, I know that leading demographer Simon Kirstenmacher recently wrote an article in his weekly column in the New Daily about how home ownership is better for everybody, for Australians, but also for the environment. Now, I know a lot of people listen to this podcast because they're interested in property investment. But since owner-occupiers make up 70% of our property markets, I believe it's critical to understand any trends relating to this significant influence. So who better to discuss this than Simon Kirstenmacher, co-founder of the Demographics Group, who many see as a rising star globally in the field of data management and insights. Hi, Simon. It's great to be back, Michael. Now, Simon, Australians seem to be obsessed with home ownership. Absolutely. That doesn't come (laughs) as a surprise to anyone who opens a newspaper occasionally, at least. The housing trends are everywhere. Australians talk about this. Australians really want to own their family home. It is almost in the Australian DNA, I would say. Sure. But how does one compare to overseas? How do Australian home ownership rate compare with international standards? Uh, Excellent question. I think it's really surprising when you think that in Australia, we have a home ownership rate of, you know, depending on how you actually count it, about two thirds of all households are owned, uh, are owner occupier households. And that compares, you know, is that high if we are obsessing so much about it? Well, there are plenty of countries with much higher home ownership rates. These are you know, your Hungary, uh, your your Slovakia, your Lithuania, your Croatia. These are countries with extremely high home ownership rates in the well into the 80s and even 90s. And so you wonder, why do those people are more likely to own their home? And the answer is a bit sad, if you will. It's these are poorer countries that are not growing as fast. They're actually declining their population. So there is plenty of housing stock available. There is no growth market to invest to. And of course, there is a different age structure and a different dwelling structure in these countries, meaning you are more likely to own a home when you're older. The people Mm -hmm. in these countries that I just listed are older, so more likely to own a home. There are fewer apartments available in these countries because they are mostly smaller settlements where you just have houses. Uh, Again, this is a house uh, or dwelling type that is more conducive to home ownership or more typically associated with home ownership. But then on the other end of the spectrum, of course, you do have your your Switzerland's uh, and, and, you know, my native country of Germany, where only 42, 43 percent of all households actually do live in a owned dwelling where home ownership isn't that obsessed about. And once again, that also has to do with the dwelling structure in European or at least in German cities, most dwellings are apartments and people are happy to move around a bit more. So that then makes home ownership a bit less typical, common in these countries. Well, what I'm hearing is we actually have to look at the demographics of the country and the age break it down. But before we look at that, I guess we get a lot of this information from the census and uh, we're going to get some results coming out uh, for, for the one we all spent time and effort doing a year or so ago. What does the census tell us about the percentage of renters in Australia? 
Yeah, so, well, we can just look at the age profile of renters. We can see how many people rent. And uh, in, a, in a long term trend, more Australians are renting than they did previously. So, you know, it's about 26% of Australians are renting, depending on how you count it, it's either households or it's individuals. So, let's call it a third, just under a third of Australians are renting. And the interesting thing is that there is, of course, a cyclical movement. So, if it's still true, which it is, that most Australians own their house, that means that the kids that still live at home tend to live in a owned dwelling. Makes a lot of sense. But then once they move out of the parental home, they can't immediately afford to buy a dwelling. So they move into a rented accommodation. And people do this throughout their 20s and 30s, usually right around uh, until the point in time where they start a family, where they then move into the first home. And that moment in time when people transition from renters into homeowners is at the moment is about um, 26 years of age when, when we have peak renting and then uh, that declines. But a couple of years ago, 10 years ago, so it was 24. So you've seen that rental, the peak rental age is pushing out as of course um, the millennials drove this trend, meaning they pushed out everything. They procrastinated on everything. Millennials popularized the gap year. That means you start uni a year later. You stay at university longer. It is more common to live at the parental home while you are studying at university if you haven't moved to another city, for example. So that really pushes everything back. But now, uh, we only now in the 2020s, we have the biggest generation in Australia, the millennials, finally leaving their 20s behind and moving into the early family formation stage of the life cycle. That means that you have the biggest population cohort leaving the phase where they are likely to be renters, moving into a phase where they are more likely to be homeowners. And that then will drive the home ownership rate up in the next coming years. We will particularly see the home ownership rate go up because the people that left the country during the pandemic were international students. They were skilled international migrants. These are people that almost exclusively live in rental dwellings. So we just take renters out of the equation and we didn't take migrants into the country for two years, which would have usually rented homes as well. So this will make Australia look like we have a much higher home ownership rate. And therefore, we might be excused, if you will, to misassume that housing has gotten more affordable if we only looked at the home ownership rate. Well, there's also been various incentives to get the first home buyers into the market and the government at state level, as in particularly the federal level, have had those various grants. In general, while the story was it's going to help first home buyers. In many ways, it was really just to grease the wheels of industry and keep the building industry busy to get us through the challenges of the pandemic a couple of years ago. Absolutely. I think if you're talking from a sheer housing affordability point where the goal, policy goal is to get as many Australians into their own home, uh, because we know that this will make sure that they are less likely to be suffering from poverty in old age. So the, uh, the treasurer, if you will, has quite the financial interest in getting home or people into their own homes because that means they need to put less into the pension funds. Mm. So if that's if that's the goal, then we probably haven't done the right thing by investing into first home buyer grants that doesn't drive up uh, supply. It only increases, you know, it just puts more money into the housing system, which is good for uh, developers, it's good for builders, um, but it probably doesn't help the the housing stock. So there is a political incentive uh, that is much more needed around making land available, you know, allowing rezoning in a bit more generous way to make sure that housing is just more commonly available. That will drive prices down. Of course, plenty of things about interest rates and about where the state cuts off a bit of money from the housing market. But that said, we're not achieving the goals, I think, to get more younger generations into their housing. Now, in your article in the New Daily, which I'll leave a link to because you've got some great charts there, doesn't the homeownership rate doesn't look as impressive once you analyse it by 
age groups, by the different cohorts. So what's really happening to the percentage of homeowners over time? Exactly. So if we look at just a couple of basic figures, so the let's say let's say people born in the late 80s, early 90s, you know, they at the age of 25 to 29, so late 20s, you know, they already had a couple of years in the workforce, not too many though. They currently have a home ownership rate of 37%. So that's not overly high. But if you look at their parents' generation, you know, they would have had a home ownership of around 50, 55%. So much, much higher. So that makes perfect sense to me to say that young generations might feel a bit uh, short changed here. Um, they, of course, you know, only started their working career later in life. So it makes sense that they had less time to accumulate enough money for, for a down payment. Uh, but the, the trend is clear that every gener every younger generation has a lower home ownership rate. Part of this will be by, by choice. We are more flexible. There are more workers that it, particularly before they reach the family formation stage, uh, that switch between cities regularly, uh, that, you know, go overseas for long periods of time. So you can't uh, manage a home in, in that time as well. But overall, it appears to be very clear uh, that housing has gotten more expensive uh, in Australia and that therefore fewer people can afford to own a home, which of course, in turn, made housing even more attractive um, for property investors. Because if people can't buy their own homes, they will still probably need to live somewhere, and that would be rented accommodation. Now, in your article, you mentioned two big benefits of home ownership. I mean, we feel good at buyers, and it's all that's all very good. But there are other bigger picture benefits. Yeah, so I think the, the probably biggest uh, benefit from a from the treasurer's perspective is that we know for a fact from beautiful research from the Grattan Institute that the most important determinate, terminating factor of old age poverty, yes or no, is whether you own a home. If you own your own home in old age, you're very, very unlikely to suffer from financial hardship. And if we overwhelmingly have to subsidize uh, renters in old age, that is very expensive for the pension system. And if you think about what the superannuation system in Australia was meant to do, it was meant to ensure that every Australian is forced to put money aside throughout their working career to mm -hmm. pay for their own retirement. That only works, though, if people have high paying jobs or at least decent paying jobs. If you look at workers that own or have very little incomes, they can't possibly scrape enough money together throughout their career to have a large enough nest egg in their superannuation. But if they have a home, then their largest expense rent falls away in, in, in old age. So it's very, very desirable from a sheer financial perspective to have people retire in their own home. Yeah. And another benefit that I, that I mentioned in the, in the article has to do with the quality of the building stock. So you can say, um, might seem a bit malicious, but you can say that a homeowner builds the best house they can possibly afford. You know, it's your, it's your castle. You buy the best, uh, door handles, the best insulation, the best carpets, the best whatever you can afford. This varies based on your personal budget, but you buy the best you can afford. Whereas an investor, or a developer purchases the cheapest thing they can possibly get away with because there is no additional you know value added to the house if the if the faucet is danish rather than chinese sure so that's one of the reasons we try and avoid in what we call investment stock built for investors simon i'm older than you and i came to australia as a migrant at the age of three in 1956 and i've noticed the type of houses we're living in was very different then. There was a uh, modern home of today is very different. These trends over the years have been brought about by the influence of migrants over the years. Initially, the Europeans, the Greeks and Italians, we ha now have Alfresco living and more recently, uh, Asian communities. What have you noticed about the change in the way we live? Ah, it's it's marvelous to see how pliable the Australian home is and how much it reflects the realities of migration into the country and the changing lifestyle preferences that we go through. Before the Italian, before the Greek migration wave in the 1950s and 60s, the houses in Australia were English. 
They were English houses and nobody questioned it until the Italians and the Greeks entered uh, Australia and were utterly confused why, why those weird Australians lived in English houses, even though they lived in a Mediterranean climate. That had them confused. And then they invented or really brought back to Australia or uh, introduced to Australia the indoor outdoor living spaces uh, to really integrate outdoor living into the family home. And that stayed with us because it was the better way of doing things. You know, we'd done the same with cuisine. We switched from mm. an English diet to a more Mediterranean diet. Coffee became a stable. Tea went a bit to the backside, uh, to the wayside there. All of these things are there to stay. We, we take or we adjust our houses based on who's coming in. And so now we are, of course, in the midst of, uh, or we were before the pandemic, in the midst of a wave from um, Ital uh, from uh, Indian and from Chinese migrants, lots of Filipinos, Asian influences uh, that will change housing preferences. I think it remains to be seen what exactly sticks, but mega trends always leave their imprint on the Australian home. After the millennium drought, we we put water tanks at the back of our homes. Uh, yes. These are here to stay now. That's now a thing that we that we add to our homes as as a stable. During the pandemic, lots of workers needed a Zoom room, a room with a door to keep the kids and the cats out of business calls, and this demand will be there. So all of a sudden, we will permanently demand larger homes because we will need a study. Some people needed a study before that, but now many more people need a study. Sure. So that's a new trend that's going to stay. And I think people are going to be a little bit wary of high density developments. They're also going to need bigger dwellings from what I can understand because they are going to need that extra room. So the studio apartments, the one bedroom apartments may be more for the students or, or the tourists. Exactly. And once again, there is a generational or a, a life cycle element to the type of housing that we need. When you move out of the parental home at the start of your uni career or whatever you do, a room in a shared house, in a shared flat, that is plenty. That's all you need. Then you live alone, you live with your partner, a one or two bedroom apartment will suffice. But once you add permanent working from home arrangements, once you add 1.7 kids to the family, once even in a pandemic, once you bring in more functions that usually took place outside the home, once you really bring them into the family home, you don't go to the cinema, you watch stuff at home. So all of a sudden you need at least some corner, even more than you did before mm -hmm. with a big TV, with a home cinema, if you will. The gyms were closed during lockdowns. So maybe you you know, transformed your garage into a little home gym. All of those functions you bring back into the home, which means you need more home in order to do all the stuff that you want to do in your life. Well, moving forward, our government's got a business plan to increase our population to around 40 million people by the middle of this century. It needs to bring the population in for the reasons we've spoken before, including just keeping our economy going and having more taxpayers to help subsidise the ageing population. Where are we going to put them all? What's the future of our housing going to look like? Very, very good question. And, you know, if you say we almost doubled the Australian population in a couple of decades, it's not that long. We add about 4 million people per decade. It's not that many decade until we add another 25 million people. Will that mean we just take Australia as is and say every city takes in twice as many people and we're done with it? I don't think that's going to work. We need to rethink where we want our people to be living and we need to rethink our current settlement patterns. Traditionally, Australia or the Australian population just clustered in five cities. Those top five cities made up two thirds of the Australian population in the decade leading up to the pandemic. These five cities made up 80% of population growth. Even though we had decades of planning in place that said we want to decentralize the population, that didn't happen because work and everybody had to have a job. Uh, work demanded that we live, uh, or that we work, sorry, that we work in a few centralized CBDs across the country. And then everybody had to commute into the CBD at the same time in the morning, commute out of the CBD at nighttime. And, you know, just live a horrible, uh, live through a horrible commute every day. Yes. But they could listen to my podcast. Ah, lucky them. 
Now they have to listen to your podcast while taking wonderful walks in their green neighborhood uh, parks. That's right. So it will be interesting to see where we're going to place all these people, but there's no doubt that cities are going to become more dense. Densification is a path that we need to be taking. Um, there's no way that you can build, that you can double the Australian population based on quarter acre blocks, based on 500 square meter blocks that would lead to endless urban sprawl. That said, this model has become a bit more possible now that we don't need to commute to the CBD every day. If you work from home, uh, you can, if you work from home at least some of the time, you can afford or you're willing to commute to the CBD for a longer distance because you only go to the CBD twice a week. So mm -hmm. you're willing to to take on a longer commute and listen to more Michael Yartney podcasts. <laughs> and that means new areas of our city, of our country, are opening up for settlements. Uh, and we've seen the big winners of the internal population reshuffle during the pandemic being um, Geelong and the Gold Coast. These are two towns that were front and center where people wanted to move. The millennials um, that lived in inner city Melbourne that just started to have families as the pandemic hit, they looked for three to four bedroom affordable dwellings. Lots of them are knowledge workers that work in the CVD of, of Melbourne. So they could easily move to Geelong and then work from home most of the time and only commute into the city. There's a train line that, you know, conveniently drops them at the center of the CVD, at the Docklands, at, at Southern Cross Station. That, that was comfortable. That, that's a good approach. Plus, Geelong uh, will be a big winner because we are reshoring manufacturing in Australia. We saw yes. that uh, we had a couple of supply chain issues during the pandemic and we figured it might be desirable if we bring back quite a few manufacturing functions to Australia. And if you want to add more manufacturing businesses somewhere in Australia, you don't put them into a completely new place where there is no uh, such infrastructure. You put them into the existing infrastructure hubs. And that's where um, Geelong, which of course lost quite a few jobs uh, from yes. the car uh, industry a couple of years back, they now benefit. They can now fill up with this and they have one of the lowest unemployment rates. I think it's 2.6% uh, or something like this. It is crazy low what Geelong has. And that's, you know, they might suffer from their own success very soon since they can't hire enough talent fast enough over there. And property values have risen very, very strongly there. Absolutely. So it'll be interesting to see how all these trends move forward. I think it's a lot in Australia's DNA as well. Australians want to own their own home. And a lot of people who come from overseas, our immigrants, aspire to own their own home. That's what they've come here for. That's why they've chosen this country. They'd like to tell the family back home, look what I've achieved. I've got a job. I've got a home. So I think, as I said right at the beginning, understanding the importance of home ownership as a trend in our property markets is critical for property investors and also for business people to understand what's happening. So thanks for your insights, Simon. Oh, it's been a delight. Simon always brings an interesting perspective to what's happening in our world. That's why I love studying about demographics, and that's part of the detailed research our research team at Metropole does when we decide where we recommend clients buy property. And because we have very detailed evidence-based research to back up our recommendations, we actually never have sold properties. We only put strategic plans together for clients and then help them implement their plan using our bias agency. Often they use our wealth advisory, financial planning, renovations, development, property management, and even business mastery departments. I don't know what you'd require, but it makes sense in these current, more challenging times to get my team at Metropole on your side to, well, not just level the playing field, stack the odds in your favour. My team has won multiple awards, and I'm very proud of the results we've achieved. A recent audit showed that our clients are 7.3 times more likely than the average Australian investor to own six or more properties. And that's because we have a framework to develop financial independence through property that we share with our clients. So why not go to metropole.com.au, find out about what we do, 
leave us your details and why not have a chat with my team to discuss your options. I look forward to being part of your ongoing wealth creation journey. Now here's Michael's mindset message. Remember, a change in your thinking will lead to a change in your life. I write a lot about money and property in my blogs. I discuss it in my podcasts. But when you get to know me, you'll realize that I believe true wealth is what you're left with when they take away all your money. Sure, money is important in some aspects of your life, but it's not important in others, is it? So in today's Mindset Moment, I'd like to share with you a list of things that you'll regret. You'll regret in the future if you don't do them now. It's a way of me emphasizing the point that money is important in those areas where it's important and not at all important in other areas of your life. So number one, put your health and wellness above everything else. There's an old saying, if you don't have your health, you have nothing. I think that's true. Number two, take the time to do the things that you love. Now, this may sound cliche, but work less and play more. You'll never regret taking a vacation, engaging in a new hobby or spending a day with those who make you happy. The third thing I'd like to remind you is to stop taking life so seriously. Why are you taking it so seriously anyway? When you think about it, most of the things you've worried about in the past never really occurred, did they? The fourth thing I'd like to share with you is always say what you need to say. If you love somebody, tell them. If somebody hurt you, tell them. If you've got trouble expressing your feelings, write a letter, do an email. Make sure that those around you know each and every day how you feel. The fifth lesson is open up your mind to possibilities. If you have a closed mind, if you stay in your comfort zone, you'll never get to the next level. You'll never truly enjoy life. The sixth lesson I'd like to share is follow your own path, live a true life one that's true to you. Stop comparing yourself to other people and stop trying to be a perfectionist. Stop living a life based on the expectation of others or what you think others are achieving. Because when you look at Facebook and you look at Instagram, you're seeing their highlight reel. You're not seeing all the bits on the cutting room floor. Another lesson to know is stop living in the past. Right now, you need to throw away the regrets from the past. It's gone. There's no point dwelling on what could have been. Doing so is only going to rob you of the the joy of what's happening at the moment. The past doesn't exist other than a memory. It's a mental story and it can't be changed, so move on. I guess that brings me to the next lesson. Accept the things you can't change. Lesson nine I'd like to share with you to show you that there are 12 things at least that are more important than money is practice mindful living. Mindful living will slow down time. It will enhance the present moment. It'll fill what could have otherwise been mundane days with awe and with joy. Appreciate what you've got. Be grateful for what you've got. The 10th lesson is stop chasing money, fame and possession. I know we crave wealth, prestige, fame and popularity. We crave material things, beautiful people, the next big toy, the shiny object. We mistakenly think that happiness is going to arrive when we meet these goals. Instead of enjoying our life, we seem to be in constant pursuit of something other than what we've already got, what we've got right now. At the end of your life, your expensive BMW, that's not what's going to be flashing through your mind. You're more likely going to be remembering about the memory of a loyal dog or a loved one. So stop chasing material possessions. There's no real happiness there, only an endless pursuit. And another lesson I'd like to mention to you is always practice gratitude. I've already said it briefly before, but you'll never ever be wealthy if you're not grateful for what we've got. And you live in the best country in the world, at the best time in history, enjoy it, appreciate it. And the last thing that's more important than money is love. Pay attention to all the sources of love in your life and you'll develop a growing sense of abundance of how much beauty surrounds you each day. So remember, there are many things in this life more important than money. I always enjoy my monthly chats with Simon Kirstenbacher, he brings an interesting demographic perspective to our housing markets. 
And if you've got some benefit and you know somebody else who'd also benefit, please tell them about the Michael Yardley podcast. Help me in my quest to make as many people as financially fluent as possible. Now, I've got another way of helping you. Just go to podcastbonus.com.au. I'll leave a link in the show notes, podcastbonus.com.au. And I've got a heap of reports and ebooks that I'd like to give to you as my way of saying thank you for listening to this podcast. I'll be back again real soon, but you can catch me on social media in the meantime. Why not join our private Facebook group? Go to Facebook and look for the Property Update private Facebook group. As I said, I'll be back again real soon. In the meantime, have a great week. Make it a great week. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Michael Yardney Podcast, which was brought to you by Metropole, who help their clients grow, protect, and pass on their wealth through strategic property and wealth advice. If you like what you heard and don't already subscribe, you'll find us on iTunes or on your favorite Android app as the Michael Yardney Podcast. Watch out for our next show, which comes to you twice a week, and you'll learn some new ideas about property investment, success, and money in around 30 minutes. To get more of Michael's thoughts, go across to www.propertyupdate.com.au and sign up for his daily morning briefing and you'll hear from not only Michael, but a group of leading property success and money experts. And just a reminder that the information you heard in this show today is general educational advice and not specific investment advice, as we don't know your personal circumstances. If you're looking for specific advice, why not ask the team at Metropole to help you?